Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in Just our five before time, just some announcements that we need to share with you. Uh, let me encourage you on the pew in front of you, there's uh, an announcement flyer that looks like this and uh, just some information and stuff that's going on here at Trinity. And then on the back side of it is uh, just some information about the church and our staff and uh, uh, the ministers that serve here at Trinity. And, and uh, we would love to be able to connect with you at, at any time. So um, we just want you to have that information. Let me remind you just a couple of announcements that are coming up. Uh, this coming Saturday, uh, we, we've gathered up all kind of uh, stuff um, here over the last several years. And uh, this Saturday, we're going to have a, an auction. And uh, if you have things you'd like to donate other than clothing, you can bring that. But it'll be on Saturday, and we'll be down near the house. We're going to try and auction that house and just a number of different things. Um, and then next Sunday evening, we want to invite you, uh, the whole church family, to head together out to Cornerstone Kids Ranch, uh, where we're going to take a time just to, uh, uh, to fellowship together and be together as a church family, and uh, something that we don't get to do very much, but we'll be able to, to uh, get to, together and do that outdoors. And uh, so we'll meet out at the um, at Cornerstone Kids Ranch next Sunday afternoon at 4 and uh, all the stuff, the pumpkin patch and all that stuff will be available. And uh, so just be our church family that will be out there uh, for a time together. Uh, this afternoon at 2 o'clock, um, I know the, the uh, family of Sid Green would like for me to share with you that there will be a, a, a service at 2, just a short service and a, and a share time uh, over in the Fellowship Center. And uh, I know they would love for you to come and be a part of that. Uh, just one other quick thing. Uh, that we want you to be aware of. We have been talking over the last several weeks that we have a couple of ministry positions open on our staff, our college and missions associate, our college girls minister, if you will, and then uh, our media communications minister. And so uh, today's kind of the deadline we established. If you or know of someone who is interested uh, to get more information about that or to share information with us, and so if you'll just uh, reach out to me by email, rusty at trinityaid.com, then I'll uh, get that information into the right hands. Hey, we are so grateful that you've joined us here today. For those of you joining us online, thank you so much for being a part of our time of worship together. And uh, we're excited, whether you're in person or online, that we are together here today to worship and to hear from the Lord. And so let me take a moment to pray for us, and then we'll begin our time of worship. Father, we come before you today, God, thanking you for your presence in this room today. God, as we continue to unpack this, this is us. God, as we really uh, jump into a delicate, difficult topic today, and talking about addictions and the stronghold that the enemy has on many of our lives. Father, I pray that this will be a time that we'll be set free from what has that, that, that which has a stronghold on our life and the addictions that many of us are struggling with and navigating through life with. Father, that we would understand the victory that is ours through your Son and through our Savior, Jesus Christ. God, may this be a day of victory, a day where people are set free from their addictions, from their stronghold. And God, we claim it in the matchless, powerful name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, church family. You have to stand. I want to encourage us before we step into this first song, uh, just to really prepare our hearts to praise the Lord. Um, as we all know, this time in life brings a lot of difficulties and brings a lot of reflection in ourself and our mind um, and maybe brings out some of those weaknesses. Um, for me, and I'm going to be very transparent, one thing that um, the enemy has really always had a hold on uh, is my mind. And as we further address these things and these topics through This Is Us, um, the Lord has just brought a lot of those things to light that the enemy has tried to use to 
say, you know, you make me feel so lonely and unworthy and just all these lies that the enemy uses to keep us from realizing that the Lord is right here with us. And so as we prepare our hearts to sing, I encourage you to take this time as we sing um, this uh, line and repeat it a couple times just to set our mind right, that we would lift our eyes from our weaknesses and all these things that the enemy uses to make us feel unworthy or lonely and to shift our eyes up to Jesus because we have all these crazy circumstances around us. But when we lift our eyes together to the Lord, we see deliverance happen. And his mercies are new with every morning. So whatever you're bringing in this room today, or whatever you're dealing with at home, as you're joining us online, that you just pour it out before the Lord, that we can worship him in spirit and in truth this morning. He wants to move in our lives. So let's bring our hearts and be ready to worship him. It's a new horizon and I'm set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new. All my fears and doubts they can all come to because it can't stay long when I'm here with you. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you.
press into you. And you would understand that life only truly begins when we surrender and give our heart to you, Lord. So I pray that we would have a greater understanding of what that surrender looks like daily. That we would grow in our relationship with you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this time to praise you. And we receive all honor and glory. And I pray that you would move in this room in that way. And that our heart would be changed by the power of your presence here today. We love you, Lord Jesus. In the beautiful name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, we are um, continuing our series today. Uh, this is us. And um, we're going to be... Uh, Jumping into a subject today that's um, it's 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 really difficult, <laughs> I think, for us to talk about and uh, to really deal with some of those issues of of addictions in our life. And um, so I, I appreciate the people who join me here each week as we've navigated through this and talked about things like anxiety and depression. Next week we're going to talk about suicide. Um, and um, but today, uh, Dr. Steve Fillmore, who is a medical doctor, is uh, joining me here on the platform. And um, this is Calvin Prince. Uh, most of you know these guys. They're members here at Trinity. And uh, Calvin is a, a counselor, a therapist, and has done that for years and years and years. And now is the director of the Pontotoc County Drug Court. And so deals with that, these issues of addiction, uh, I mean, head on, straight on every day. And so... Calvin, just kind of speaking based on your experience, you know, and what God's called you to do and obviously gifted you to do as, as far as being a, a therapist, a counselor, and also the drug court. Um, may, maybe it's an oversimplified question, but, but why, do, why do addicts become addicts? There we go. Got it. Test, test. Okay. I uh, I want to say uh, thanks to um, Rusty and 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 the church staff for for this sermon series um, because I think it it speaks into a lot of of what's going on and so to to dovetail. Uh, what Craig and, and Todd and, 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 and Tangra has, has presented in, in past weeks in regards to this series, um, this, this is us. I mean, this is, these are, there are issues that, that we're all dealing with. Um, I, a uh, little bit about, about me, I, I came from a divorced family. My, my parents divorced when I was five. I haven't seen my mother since then. I had two younger brothers, uh, five, three, and two. And our mom left, and we haven't seen her since. And so dealing with that, dealing with abandonment of, of your mom uh, has, has, has been something that I've always, always had, had, dealt, had to deal with. Being black uh, in, in, in this America, more so now than, than ever, is, is, is a challenge. Uh, for me and, 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 and Tracy and I raising two boys uh, or half raised two boys and, and getting ready to help with granddaughters. And so, so the anxiety and the, the challenges that um, strikes individuals that causes them to, you know, we talked about ACEs and, and the adverse experiences for for people um that's mm -hmm. that's me mm -hmm. um and and i look back at what what happened in my life and how how did i come through that and i had a grandmother and a grandfather and a dad who made sure we were in church mm -hmm. and and with 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 the struggles and the and the challenges that that I face, I'm not, I'm not sure where, 
where I would be had it not been for Christ being in my life. Hmm. Because, you know, the choices that, that, that people make when, when they're dealing with those types of, of issues, um, dealing with divorce, dealing with growing up in a single-parent home, wondering why your mom doesn't choose you, was, 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 was a challenge. And so I could have easily went down that path of, mm-hmm. of, of, of using, trying to find um, that escape. And so the people that I work with who choose to, to, to use substances are, are doing it to cope mm-hmm. with, with life. Uh, doing it to to get through the day. It's 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 surviving. It's self medicating. It's it's changing how you feel. They they just want to change how they feel. Uh, I pray I pray every every morning and thank God for allowing me to be in my right mind. Mm. Um, because not being in your right, right, right mind makes you do things, use things to, to help. And so people who are dealing with substances, it's and, and the disease of addiction, um, it's a disease. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a disease. It's, it's not something that they wanted. Mm-hmm. They, they didn't. They didn't want to be addicted. Um, they, they just simply wanted to change how they feel. Uh, I, t- I tell them all the time, you know, there's only one true answer to beating the disease of addiction, and that's Jesus Christ. One true, one true, one true yeah. answer. Mm. Um, it's, it's, Disease is more powerful than your freedom. It's more powerful than your, your children, your career. Dise- the, the disease is that powerful. And you will choose that drug, whether it be methamphetamine, marijuana, alcohol, prescription, Lortab, Xanax. You'll choose that because the disease is more powerful. But again, the, the answer is, is, is Christ. Last week, Rusty went through 1 Kings 19. And it talks about Elijah and, and the running, trying to escape from the, the struggle, trying to find some, some place to hide. And, 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 and choosing to just give up. I mean, people struggling with this disease, that's what they're saying. I'm t- I've had enough. Mm-hmm. And, and, and they choose that because they just want to get away uh, from that. And so the... I think the message here is that Christ is the answer here. And I don't know where I would be had that not, had I not been exposed to that. Mm-hmm. Had, had, had not my grandparents, and you know, I said, I said my grandparents took us to church. They made us go to church. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And thank God for that. Because I don't know where I would be. Yeah, amen, amen. You know, Steve, one of the things that um, um, Calvin talked about is just in this coping thing and kind of how we think, and we're going to be speaking into that today. But just from you, as as an as an MD, this this kind of this, um, I, I think mentally, you know, what happens to people? What happens to us when we get to that place of, of finding ourselves in these in these strongholds of of addictions? I mean. Um, you know, from a medical standpoint, how do, you know, how, how do we, how do we get to that place, basically, I guess? 
Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And I think we would all agree that our world was broken before we learned this COVID word. Mm -hmm. When I talk to my students, I tell them what's wrong is not usually the pertinent question. Why is usually a better question. And the why is what we need to address. There are 25 million people in the United States with an addiction illness. And we all know how to define an illness. The question is, how do you define an addiction? Well, you have a stimulus and you have a learned response and to that stimulus and you're all sitting there going, well, that's a habit. Well, a habit can be good or bad and addiction by definition is a bad learned behavior. About 75% of those 25 million people are addicted to alcohol. And I looked up the statistic. Every adult male and every adult female in this room drank 25 gallons of beer last year. We were sitting there going, Doc, I didn't quite drink my 25. And that means somebody you know and love drank his 25 and your 25 gallons of beer last year. About 25% of the people are addicted to, as Calvin said, narcotics or other meds, meth and things. To give you a statistic there, the United States is 5% of the world's population and we take 95% of the world's prescription narcotics. Clearly, we have a problem. Clearly, things that are broken. And as he said, there's a hole in our heart and we're going to fill that hole with something and you're sitting there going, how do you get a hole in your heart? I don't think Rusty knew that he was going to have two guys sitting up here on the stage at the same time who had a mom who walked and who had a dad and grandparents who made them go to church. Mm -hmm. I don't think Rusty knew that before today. So let me give you how you get a hole in your heart. It's a Saturday. It's a beautiful day. You spent the day with your wife and your sons and you cannot picture a better day. And the phone rings and your sister says the words, Dad had another heart attack, and this time he didn't make it. Mm. You have a ginormous hole in your heart, and the question is, how are you going to fill it? And in Ephesians 4.27, when, when the words are, don't give the devil, devil a foothold or an opportunity, or don't allow the devil to make a stronghold in your heart, you're going to fill it with something. And so let's back up a little bit and look more at Elijah. In, in 1 Kings 17, he's hanging out by a brook, and he's being fed by ravens. And I know it's almost lunchtime, but I'm going to make you sick. Look up what ravens eat, and that's what they're bringing him. Well, that's us today without we lost our job, our checking account's empty, nobody loves us, and we're all alone. Those are all lies that God is saying to us. Nobody's feeling real successful at the moment when you're sitting by a brook and a raven is bringing you what they eat. How do we get through that? Well, the first step is to admit you have a problem. And uh, put on your grandfatherly voice when you read Deuteronomy chapter 1, the first eight verses. And you can hear Moses telling the Israelites, you took 40 years to wander around for an 11-day journey. Step one Admit you have a problem, make it a conscious thing. Step two, begin to get some help. And the help is not instant. And if you own a McDonald's, I'm sorry, but I'm going to pick on you. Buying a Happy Meal in a drive through and supersizing it does not make you happy. <laughs> it is not an instant fix. It just doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work. Mental illness, drug addiction is, is like having a stroke. And, and you can go to well-meaning friends that want to help you with that stroke, but I would propose to you that you're going to do better if you get professionals to help you with that. You need professional help to deal with whatever your addiction is. Let me give you a couple Bible examples. You're Peter. You're walking on the water, and you're going, wow, this is great. I can walk on water. And Satan says to you, uh, look down. And instantly, you're swimming like my son's bulldog. And if none of you have ever seen a bulldog swim, it resembles a rock with fur on it. They don't <laughs> swim well. <laughs> Jesus says to him, oh, ye of little faith. And the word faith meant what we would say is on a hamster wheel going around and around the same circle, believe, don't believe, believe, don't believe. Oh, yeah, a little faith. 
the other example is Elijah. He's just finished with Mount Carmel, and he runs off and he hides in his cave all alone because Satan is telling him, you're worthless, you made a mistake, nobody loves you. You guys know I work part-time in Lawton, and when Rusty calls me and, and he says this sentence, I'm going to give you two sentences that there's one letter difference in the two sentences. The first one is, what are you doing there? Where's Rusty and where am I? And if he says, what are you doing here? Where's Rusty and where am I? And God says to Elijah, when Elijah's in the cave, all alone, feeling worthless, what are you doing here. And how far away was Jesus when Peter decides he can't walk on water anymore? If he can reach out and grab him and pull him up, how far away is God the next time Satan says to you, you're worthless. You don't matter. Nobody loves you. How far away is God? Amen. Amen. Well, let me take a moment to pray and, um, and, um, we're just going to kind of take what these guys have shared with us and what I want to share with you from Scripture today and, and really just to, um, to unpack a, a lot of difficult truth today. Father, I thank you for Calvin and Steve and God for what they do. Father, for so many in this church who are doctors and counselors and, and God who desire so much to help, and I pray that uh, God that will reach out for that help. I thank you for them and others who have given us permission to, to ask them uh, Father, I pray today that as we talk about this, um, this really, I think, delicate um, struggle, stronghold that so many have with addiction, God, that you just help us as we unpack the truth of your word, that you speak into that in a powerful and a very strong way. And Father, for those of us who are held in the stronghold of addiction, that today we would be, that we would be set free from that. Father, I thank you that when the Son sets us free, that we're free indeed. And Father, as Calvin just talked about that, that place that we're trying to fill in our lives, as Steve shared with that hole in our lives, we're trying to fill with something. Father, may we cry out to you today, the only thing that can fill that Jesus-shaped hole in any of our lives. The only thing that will do that is a relationship with you. So, Father, today, I pray that you speak to hearts that are discouraged and defeated and held in stronghold, that today will be a day of celebration and freedom. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> We've been talking over the last couple of weeks kind of the scripture that we have used as, as sort of a launching pad for this series of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And when Paul begins to talk to the church at Corinth, and if you want to read some of what was going on at the church at Corinth, you can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and he talks about um, people being angry and abusive in their language. He talks about people uh, d dealing with the, the, the struggle of homosexuality and just a number of different, it's really just kind of a short list. But then Paul jumps in here in the book of 2 Corinthians in chapter 1, and he talks about these things that... He calls them afflictions. You may remember this verse of verse 4, 2 Corinthians 1, that I shared with you a couple of weeks ago as we launched this series. He comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort that we ourselves receive from God. What I want you to hear from this series and from this sermon today is that, that I'm not up here, we're not up here to beat anybody up or to, uh, to push anybody down further. In fact, Paul, uh, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians 10 today, if you want to find that passage of Scripture. But Paul made the statement in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 8, that, that my, my, desire, my desire is to build you up and not tear you down. Paul said, that's what I want to happen. And I want you to hear that's my heart today. I want you to be built up. I'm not up here to tear you down or, or to make you angry or to, to cause you to feel bad about yourself, worse than you may already feel. But my, my prayer today is that we would be encouraged today. We talked about this thing, why, why, do we, why have we titled this series on mental health, This Is Us? I think if there's any place that we tend to 
that we tend to think in terms of addiction that it's, 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 this is them. This is other people who are dealing with addiction. These are people who are outside the walls of the church who are far from God. But I would say to you, all of us struggle with addiction at some point, at some level in our life. That every one of us are, are predisposed to something or some things. But here's the truth. We don't have to yield to our predisposition. I don't know what you are predisposed to or what your, the stronghold is that Satan has built up and established in your life. But, but all of us have those things. All of us deal with those issues. Maybe it is alcohol. Maybe it's drugs. Maybe it's gambling, which is a huge struggle in our culture today. Maybe it's food. Maybe it's too much or not enough. And you can look at me and guess which is which. Maybe it's, maybe it's pornography, which is a huge struggle in our culture today. 47% of Christian people say they struggle at some level with pornography. That means that almost half of the people in this room struggle at some level with pornography. We don't like to talk about these things. And again, I'm not bringing them up and surfacing them to make you feel bad or guilty or shameful about where you are or who you are, I want to speak the truth of God's Word into your life today to help you understand that this stronghold of Satan can be destroyed. It can be, Paul uses the word, demolished in our lives. I, I think we have to... Uh, we have to come to the terms with this truth. You know, this thing of, of, of we're all predisposed to something, but we don't have to yield to our, our predis, predisposition. That, that's easier said than done, right? I mean, it, we, we, we think about that and we think, well, yeah, that's you're right, Rusty, because how many of us in this room haven't struggled with whatever stronghold it is in our life, whatever affliction it is in our life with sin, that sin in our life? And we've said, God. If you'll forgive me one more time for doing that, I promise I will never do that again. How many times have you said, you know what, that was the last time I will do whatever it is that is your predisposition, whatever it is that is your stronghold or your struggle, that you've said, I, 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 will, I will never ever do that again. And what happens, we find ourselves caught in that same trap and that same stronghold of committing that same sin over and over again. I know a lot of people don't agree with this, but... And you may not, and it's okay, you have the right to be wrong. But, but I think this truth has to be hammered home in us. Addicted people don't want to be addicted. We don't want to be addicted to the things that we are addicted to. And I'm not talking specifically narrowing it down to drugs and alcohol. I'm talking about whatever it is that is that stronghold in your life. Maybe it is pornography, maybe it is food. Maybe it is a homosexual lifestyle. Whatever that is, to, to understand that, that I, don't, I don't necessarily want that to be a part of my life. Addicted people don't want to be addicted. And so Paul calls this, calls this struggle that we deal with a, a stronghold in our life. And if, if it's that strong and we don't want it, how do we break free from the stronghold? I want to unpack from 2 Corinthians 10 three or four things to you. Number one is this. We need to live lives that are controlled by the Spirit of God and not live lives that are controlled by our flesh. Every person in this room, everyone watching online today, everybody walking on the face of this planet is either controlled by the Spirit of God or they're controlled by their flesh, one or the other. And it's a constant battle and turmoil that's going on inside of us. Paul described it this way in verse 3. For although we live in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. The flesh is waging war in our life. It's a constant battle that's going on in our life. Listen, the war has been won when Jesus died on the cross, when he rose from the grave. The war was won, but we still battle the flesh every day of our life. I heard a guy uh, describe it this way one time. I feel like that there are two dogs on the inside of me. One is the flesh and one is the spirit. And these two dogs are constantly fighting with one another. And someone asked the question, which dog wins, the flesh or the spirit? And he said, the one that I feed the most. And the reason we give way to the flesh and we stay in the stronghold of our addiction 
whatever that is, is because we are feeding the flesh. We're giving way to the flesh. And we are to be led, not by the flesh, but by the Spirit of God. And this is a battle that's going on in every one of our lives, every day of our lives. And it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop when you become a believer. I'm 65, I became a believer, Christ follower at nine. And I battle with the flesh every single day. Tony Evans put it this way. When you got saved, your flesh didn't disappear. Our flesh got well trained before we got saved. (laughs) When you get saved... It's no longer, it doesn't mean that you're not going to have this battle with the flesh any longer. It's constantly going to go on in your life. And so you have to feed the Spirit. You have to get into the Word. You have to be in prayer. You have to get alone with the Lord. You have to feed that Spirit. Stop feeding the flesh of your life. Here's the second thing. We have to realize that this is, that this is spiritual warfare that requires spiritual armor. If I'm going to get out of this stronghold, I have, to, um, I have to realize that this battle with the flesh that I'm facing, with my stronghold, with my addiction, and those words are synonymous, stronghold or addiction are synonymous with one another. If, if, if I'm going to get out of this, I have to learn that this is spiritual warfare. Again, how many times have you said in your flesh, I'm done with this? I'm finished with this addiction. Again, addicted people don't want to be addicted. You don't want to be in that addiction. And you've committed to yourself, you've promised yourself that you're going to stop, that you're going to get out of it, and you're trying to fight that battle in the flesh, and you'll never win that battle in the flesh. Here's what Paul said, verse 4. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God for the demolishing of strongholds. This is not a battle of flesh and blood. The battle for your soul is a spiritual battle. I ask myself the question every morning. Rusty, what, what, what would you like to wear today? And you can look at me and think, well, you're making wrong choices. It, 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 it appears that the light bulbs burn out in my closet most days. I get that, okay? I don't, I don't worry about that question as, lo- as, as much as some people do. I mean, some people worry about it a lot, and it takes them forever to get ready. And, and we go to our closet, we open a closet up, it's full of clothes, and what do we say? I've got nothing to wear. You don't make the choice. Then I think today I just won't wear anything. Thank God you don't make that choice. I, um, I was a student at Oklahoma State um, in the early to mid-70s, and there was this phenomenon that was kind of making its way across college campuses called streaking. And people would literally take off all, all, all of their clothes, and they would just, they would run, they would streak. And, and um, I, don't, I don't know what, in any context who ever thought that was a great idea, but that was just... It's what we, it, I say we, I, I never did that, okay? <laughs> I want to be abundantly clear. But, but I, think, I think here's what happens to us. Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians in the sixth chapter that we need to put on the full armor of God. And I think there are a lot of us, and I will include me in this, that a lot of times spiritually, forgive the analogy, but I think sometimes spiritually we are running around naked. That we've not taken the time to fully, and Paul said, listen, put on the full armor of God, every part of it, put on God's armor, because this is spiritual warfare, and we're not prepared for battle because we've not put on the armor of God. And if you wait until you're in the battle, you've waited too long. It's too late then. Most time the flesh is going to win. It's, it's, it's a spiritual battle. It's spiritual warfare. Here's the third thing we can do to break this stronghold. We, we have to learn to control our thinking. You see, the struggle, the struggle is in, in, our, in our thinking. Paul described it this way in the last part of verse 4. 
the, the weapons, or excuse me, in verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not in the flesh, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. Now listen to this, last part of verse 4. We demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. The New Living Translation takes that verse of Scripture and says, we, we destroy every, every proud obstacle. This, this, this stronghold, this barrier, this, this argument, this proud thing that we raise up against the knowledge of God. Eugene Peterson, who wrote the, the, the paraphrase of the Bible, the message, I, I think even though it's a paraphrase, nailed it closer to the original language. It's this tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God. The, the, the word literally interpreted is, is, is like partition. We, we establish these obstacles, the New Living Translation. The message says we erect these barriers against the truth of God. Uh, the, the original Greek is we put up these partitions. And, and, and I think what Paul has in mind here is that we section off our mind. We partition off our mind and God doesn't have access to, to every part of our mind or every part of our thinking. And the truth be known is we don't want him to be a part of every part of our mind and our thinking. We want some of that to be separated from him. We don't want him to have the knowledge of that, knowing all the time as a Christ follower that he's omniscient God, that he knows everything, the thoughts, even the thoughts that we have. And so we have thoughts that. That are so ungodly, that are so inappropriate and. And God, through His Spirit, is trying to speak into that, into our life. But we put up this barrier, this obstacle, this partition that we don't want to hear God speak. We don't want to hear the voice of God because even though we're in our addiction, addicted people don't want to be addicted, we, we struggle with getting out of that. And so we don't want God or His Holy Spirit convicting us about it. And so in our mind, we put up this obstacle, this barrier, this partition that closes out the voice of God when he's trying to speak into our life. And so I have to I have to submit. And that's why Paul said, submit every thought to Christ. Give every thought to him. If you ever had thoughts, you think, I can't believe I just thought that. I may be the only one in this room, but sometimes when I'm praying. I'll have a thought run through my mind and think, I can't believe I had that thought while I was praying. See, that's the way the enemy works. And we have to bring every thought under, under the obedience of Christ to, to, to tear down those barriers that we've erected against the truth of God. Here's a fourth thing. We need to learn to live in complete, absolute obedience to the Lord. He says the last part of verse 5, take every thought captive to obey Christ. And we are, to re we are ready to punish any disobedience once your obedience is complete. The, the reason we don't have victory is because our obedience is not complete. You see, we are to live under the umbrella of God's authority in our life. And um, that means in every part of my life I'm to be obedient to Him. And when he begins to convict me and speak to me, um, I, have, I have to be obedient to that. I make a choice. Am I going to obey what God's saying? Am I going to disobey what God's saying? And we made it so easy to disobey. I, I remember walking through Safeway Grocery Store when I was a kid with my mom. And she's buying groceries. And we walked down a particular aisle where all the magazines are and as a junior high boy, there were certain things, magazines, that my, my eyes were, were drawn to. And I'm just being honest, I would sneak a peek. And you say, well, I can't believe you would admit that. You show me a junior high boy that's not going to sneak a peek, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you a kid that uh, he's messed up. I'm just being real. That, that's, I mean, that's how we struggle. Am I right? That's how that's what we deal. I mean, that's just what what happens. And you know, now we don't have to sneak a peek. Now we 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 put a smartphone in the in the, can, in the hands of a junior high boy that dumbs him up, and he doesn't have to sneak a peek anymore because he has pornography right in his hand all the time. 
It doesn't stop there. It carries over into our life. We make choices that there are going to be places of disobedience in our life. We're almost like, God, you don't have permission. You don't have permission in this area of my life. And that stronghold fortifies. It becomes more intensified in our life. And it becomes more difficult for us. And we step out from the umbrella of God's authority in our life and say, God, I got this part of my life. How's that worked out for you? We have to bring every thought captive. We have to live in absolute obedience to Him. And the reason we don't have victory is because it's not finished. There's a place of disobedience. Finish your, disobe- your, your obedience. There's still places that we're holding out. That one thing that we've not brought under His authority, under the umbrella of His authority and obedience. You say, Rusty, I'm struggling with this particular thing in my life. Whatever that addiction, affliction, stronghold is for you, I'm struggling with it in my life and I don't get it. I, I, I go to church. I read the Bible. I pray. What part of your life are you unwilling to bring under complete obedience to Him? If I've told you this once, I've told you a hundred times that that it, that, that as Christ's followers, if obedience isn't complete, it's not obedience. And he said our obedience has to be absolutely, it has to be absolutely complete. Paul made this statement in verse 7. He said, look at what is obvious. <laughs> I want you to look at the first six verses. It's obvious. It's obvious why we're in the position we're in. Why we're in this stronghold in our life. It's obvious that we all deal with it. We all struggle with it. It's not this is them, this is, but it's this is us. We all struggle with addiction at some level, at some place, at some point in our life. All of us are addicted to something or some things. We're predisposed to them. But it doesn't mean that they have to control us. This is obvious, but then he makes this statement. Look at what is obvious, and then he says to us, If anyone is confident that he belongs to Christ, let him remind himself of this, just as he belongs to Christ, so do we. The only power that can demolish the stronghold of Satan in your life is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that's going to fill the hole that these guys talked about is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Do I I belong to Him? Am I His? Don't ever expect to demolish the stronghold of the addiction apart from, from Jesus Christ living on the inside of you. I think part of our struggle and our tension is this. We, we allow our stronghold, our addiction to define us. I'm a drug addict. It's not who you are, it's what you do. I have homosexual tendencies. I'm, I'm a homosexual. It's, it's what you do, it's not who you are. You fill in the blank, whatever it is, whatever stronghold, whatever addiction that you deal with. Listen, that, that, we, we allow that to define us, but we have to get this place. It, it's, it, it's what you do, it's not who you are. It's not who you are. And in the midst of your addiction and your stronghold, When the enemy begins to lie to you and say, you know, that's who you are. You are an addict. Remind him that's what you do. And you're breaking out of that stronghold that he has on your life. But that's not who you are. Remind the enemy that you are a blood-bought child of the living God. That's who you are. That's who you are. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Father, I, uh, I want to, God, just speak into the lives of those who are Christ followers. And if you are a Christ follower in this room, 
you know that what we've talked about today is not just those who are far from God. It's, it's us of dealing with our addiction, our stronghold, our affliction, whatever we want to call it. It's us. And Father, every time the enemy attacks us, and every time he wants to pull us into that stronghold and to choke us out, God, I pray that we will remind him that we are that we have been purchased by the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's who we are. That we've been bought and paid for with a price. And we will not be defeated. My prayer for those of you who are not followers of Christ, maybe you're in this room today and you're not a believer. Man, I want you to hear what Calvin said. The only hope is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't expect to ever get out of it if you don't have a relationship with Christ. Maybe you're listening online today. You're not a believer. You're not a follower of Christ. I want to invite you in these moments to pray a prayer with me. A prayer of freedom, of liberty, that will demolish the stronghold in your life. to just pray with me. Dear God, I've, I feel like I'm in this stronghold of the enemy. And I can't break free. Would you free me today from my stronghold, from my affliction, from my addiction? Would you set me free through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the power of His resurrection, I invite you to come into my life and set me free. Today, my prayer for all of us is <laughs> that we would experience liberty and freedom from the stronghold of Satan on our life today. That we would trust in Jesus Christ and the scripture says the one that he sets free will be free indeed. Today will you tell the enemy that may be what I'm doing but that's not who I am. I am a blood bought child of the living sovereign all powerful God. Remind him of who lives in you. Because the one who lives in you is greater than the one who lives in the world. God, I pray that as we sing of, in a time of reflection, God, this will be a time of commitment. For those of us who are Christ's followers, to demolish the stronghold in our life through the power of the Spirit that lives within us. Whatever that addiction is, God, you are stronger than our addiction. You are stronger than what has us enslaved. You are stronger than any stronghold. Father, I pray for those who are not followers of yours, but they prayed that prayer today, God, that they would know in their spirit right now the absolute, complete freedom that has come to their life. God, we celebrate you in this moment, the one who can break down every stronghold and every chain that has us bound. And God, we're thankful for your amazing grace that has made us children, blood-bought children of the living God. Would you stand with us and let's sing together?
To, uh, to be seated. We're going to celebrate baptism in just a moment. Before we do that, let me, those of you who are watching online today, let me ask you not to click off of this yet, okay? Um, I, I want, we want to be able to celebrate with you. If you prayed that prayer with me today, we want to celebrate that with you today. And so if you would right now in your home, go to trinity80.church. At the bottom of the homepage, there's a form that you can fill out and I know I say this every Sunday, but this is so important. God's called us to disciple you, to help you follow through in baptism. And so we just want to help you take those steps. So if you'll give us just that, that little bit of information. If you're in the room in worship today, you can do the same thing through the website. But also in the pew in front of you, there's a decision card that we would encourage you to take. Just a quick second to fill out. Uh, it literally will take you just a few seconds to give us uh, just some information uh, that we would love to be able to share with you. Um, man, we're going to celebrate baptism today for those who have, who have prayed to receive Christ, who have passed. Paul told the church at Corinth, man, the old has become new. We pass from death to life, and we're going to celebrate that today. And We celebrate that with you today for those of you who have made decisions to follow the Lord Jesus. Good morning, church. Just like, uh, just like Rusty said, um, today we get to celebrate new life. Today we get to celebrate um, someone that has, that has passed from, from, from death and, and into life. So this is my friend Hunter, and, and Hunter uh, has, has come before you guys. Uh, 
He's been uh, coming around to the youth ministry for a little bit over a year now, and about two two months ago, uh, he he came to me and just wanted to ask some questions just about what it means to follow Jesus. And uh, just over the course of those conversations, uh, man, God has just opened up his heart to following him. So Hunter, I'm going to ask you to face these guys right here. And Hunter, it's because of your profession of faith that I get to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. to see you guys. Uh, man, I love to see the baptismal water stirred. Come on down, Bridges. Uh, this is Bridges. Bridges is one of our uh, students at East Central. Is also on our leadership team. A little bit over a year ago, uh, Bridges was in one of our small group studies led by one of one of our students and uh, prayed to receive Christ. One of the students got the privilege of, uh, of leading him to, to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and I get the privilege of baptizing him. So it's kind of a team effort here, and I love it when it happens that way. I, I think that's great, and it's good to see that when the church is working like that. So Bridges, because of your uh, profession of faith, it is my privilege to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. With a fan club up. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Hey, um, Kyle, Kyle Stewart, who is our chairman of deacons, is going to come share an announcement with you guys as he's coming. I want to ask, uh, Caleb, I don't know if you're still upstairs, and Dave, if you're in the room somewhere, uh, I want to ask those two guys, if you would, to come forward. And um, so we, we take the opportunity to celebrate anniversaries. Evidently, David's raptured out, and we've all been left behind. Surely if God would take him, he would take us. Um, so we, we, uh, we take the time to, to celebrate anniversaries for staff around here. And um, uh, Dave uh, has been on staff uh, here at Trinity uh, for 17 years um, while he was actually uh, recovering from having the COVID. <laughs> And it uh, didn't feel much like celebrating, but we want to do that a couple of weeks late here. And uh, so I, I got a gift for you down there, brother. That, that book is, is for you. I gave you an iPad that you haven't turned on once, and so the book is for you. Um, those of you that know Dave, you're not su surprised. You don't have to turn that on. That's right, brother. You also got to carry that big book around where you could carry around a little bitty thin iPad, but there you go. Um, but, man, just... <laughs> Dave is one of those guys, as you know, just, uh, man, does. I describe, I describe his job description as he does what nobody else wants to do um, and does it just with such an incredible heart, and we love you, brother. And Caleb, uh, come this way, my friends. So this, this, actually today, this Sunday, the 25th of October, five years ago, uh, Caleb came to serve here as our youth minister, and, and so the, the, he, he may try and give you that book, but don't take it. Um, <laughs> you may say, well, that's a ripoff. He's been here five and he's been here 17. He gets an iPad and he gets a book. Well, again, we gave him one of those. And so it's probably still, with, in fact, that's it. That's it right there. Yeah, that's it. So, yeah. Hey, I, I want you to know, man, I love you guys. Uh, I appreciate you so much. And one of the things I love about our staff is we're not just coworkers, we're friends. And, um, and I'm grateful for the relationship with these two guys, but all of our all of our staff. So um, you can't hug them or shake their hand or punch them or anything else. But just as you head out today, just tell them how much you appreciate them. And Kyle, I'm going to turn it over to you, brother, and then you, uh, if you'll lead us in prayer to to dismiss. Well, uh, just a, a fitting uh, uh, segue into what I wanted to, to talk about. So, uh, guys in the room, if you've ever, um, uh, on your wife's birthday or your anniversary, kind of thought of that about 9 o'clock uh, that night, um, that's kind of where we find ourselves as a church. Um, October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and I believe this is October 25th. I know it's the last Sunday in October, and I know that we have not shown our pastors that we appreciate them. And so... Um, 
we, there's so many things we can't do right now because of COVID. Uh, we can't gather and, and have finger foods and desserts and things like that. But, but one thing that we can do um, is we can all take a, a, a piece of piece of paper, a note card, and a pen, and write these guys just a short note to let them know how much you love and appreciate them. Um, uh, you know, we could celebrate these anniversaries, and, and and I just think of all the amazing things that that our pastors and leaders and our staff members do for us that we take for granted. Um, this year especially has been uh, extra challenging uh, for these guys, just trying to figure out what to do and how to do it. I mean, there's tape on the pews for crying out loud. I mean, it's 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 a crazy time that we're living in. So, over the next couple of weeks, if you wouldn't mind, you don't have to do them all at once. Uh, you you might get a hand cramp if you've tried to uh, write them all at one time. But but take some time over the next few weeks to write each each of these guys a little note, just to let them know how much you love them and appreciate them. Uh, I'd even go as far as to say, if you want to throw a gift certificate in that note and and maybe buy them dinner or or an ice cream cone or something like that, but but let's let these guys know how much we care about them. Um, I, I think it would be amazing, and I think this is something that we could do if, if each one of our staff members had uh, a note that they could read for the rest of 2020. I mean, that's not that many days, and, and there's a whole bunch of us, and so I think we could do that. Uh, but let's take some time, let them, let them know how much we appreciate them and how much we love them. So let's pray. Lord, we, uh, we just thank you for the word that you've given today, Father. Um, I thank you for, um, for Rusty and, and, and his boldness to, to tackle some of these harder uh, topics that, that sometimes we don't want to talk about, but Lord, that we all struggle with. And so thank you for that word. I, I just pray that it would penetrate our hearts, Father, and that we would, um, that we would just run to you, Lord, because you truly are the only answer to the struggles and addictions that we face. Um, Lord, we just thank you uh, so much for all of our staff and our leaders here. Lord, we're so blessed, and, and uh, I just ask that we as a church body, Lord, would be able to express our appreciation to them over the next few weeks. It's in your name we pray. Amen.